I know everything. Ask me if I don't know a lot. Panel of one. Looking for Dana, John, and Patrick. Dr. Formby. Oh, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Test, test. Okay. So I'm going to do a little singing and dancing. Just kidding. Um, yeah, well, I was in The Wizard of Oz in fifth grade, <laughs> and it was awesome. So we're going to experiment with something interactive. So a show of hands, who here has a cell phone that has access to a web browser? <laughs> if you haven't raised your hands, I know you're lying because I've seen you on your phone. So if you want to scan this QR code up on the screen, or you can enter the URL, which is up at the teeny tiny top. Yeah. And panelists, you can join too. I just discovered this a couple days ago, and it's really fun. I promise. Yeah, and the more interaction we have, the more fun we're going to have. The more emojis we can put up on the screen. Look at all those emojis. <laughs> all right, y'all. So uh, Patrick and Dana should be coming in momentarily. But um, the purpose of this session is to kind of button everything up, right? You guys... Y'all have heard uh, a number of different topics about how to build resilient urban forests and arboricultural communities, right? We've talked about beneficial insect secondary agents, primary agents that are problematic. Um, we've talked about uh, defensible si space, situational awareness. Let me see. We've talked about changing the narrative we have around trees, right? And how to communicate that to different stakeholders, our customers. We've talked about fire cycles. We've talked about fire as a, as a beneficial, beneficial thing and as a tra tragedy, okay? So we're gonna get, get our panelists situated. Kayla's gonna take us through this exercise with uh, AHA slides. So yeah, go ahead and get that QR code on your phone. And then we'll kind of transition um, after um, queuing you all and asking you questions about your experience and your perspective as professionals in the industry to asking these professionals and these experts. Awesome. Okay, has everybody joined us on this incredible feat of technology? Yeah, does anybody need help? Joran left his phone at his table. Really? Do you wanna? All right. Okay, so what have you guys learned at this conference that you can start using on Monday morning? We just got back from another conference and a woman asked me what my takeaways are and then she said, oh, that's okay, it's like a lot of information to digest, but she likes to go home with one thing that she can implement. Fire can be a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, very good. When to stop pruning and processing slash on mitigation projects, okay? Don't ever drink conference coffee. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Bet, okay, all right, cool. Bet, Joey. Um, 
Chipping releases VOCs. Best way to deal with pruned material from stress pinions. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Timing of using wood chips. Okay, okay, you guys gotta slow down a little bit. Wouldn't it be great if the Xeriscape rebate program would give more <laughs> points for species diversity? You know, that's a solid point. So uh, all of these are gonna be saved. So I will personally make sure that these get to the appropriate people that can maybe make that change. Let's see, knowledge of tree rings to tell stories of the history and culture in this state that I love. I love that. I don't know who put that, but that's, don't leave your crock pot on. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Okay, bugs are really cute even if they're pests, yes. Uh, asking for more money from our city government, yes. Cut down more small trees, um, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, spotted, lantern, spotted lantern fly is scary, okay. Yes, Dana will approve. Uh, good review of beneficial insects. Not all birds are good. <laughs> um, it's all one big juxtaposition. Yeah, man, I feel you on that. Let's see, what else? Uh, there are tools available to estimate the value of trees. Yes, love that. Start looking into adding more diversity in tree planting. Heck yes. And we're gonna talk about that on the panel discussion as well, and I think it's time to get started, but you guys love that? Those emojis are cool. This is AHA Slides. For anybody who wants to use it, there's games that you can use on it, and it's so much fun. Okay. Okay. Okay, our next question uh, for you all uh, was posed by BCMA, Board Certified Master Arborist and the founder of Think Trees New Mexico, Brian Sir over here. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. Um. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. Sorry, I forgot to do that. So um, joining us on the panel are two people you aren't familiar with or may not be familiar with. We have Graham Davis who um, works at Legacy Tree Company as a consultant and he has a master's in entomology from NMSU. Give us a wave, Graham. Hey everyone. And we have Joran Veers of JV Horticultural, right? Joran Veers Horticultural. Welcome, Joran. Also a BCMA, um, along with the other panelists whom you are familiar with. Um, uh, those two are, are part of that monthly panel discussion. So you guys, uh, y'all see that we have this question up here and you're all already starting to respond. I appreciate that. And this was posed by Brian. Is this proper pruning? Take a close look. Looks like the answer is so they're starting to cover up that that work a little bit, but we'll kind of blaze through this and then we'll start the, the discussion with our panelists, so. Okay, so is this proper pruning? Why or why not? Depends on what the goal is. No, multiple leaders, depends on the species. No, this is lion stealing. Can't see the cuts, might have been, might, how, how might have it been pruned? Uh, biomechanics are dodgy. Cool, show us the cuts. I, I feel like I'm seeing a lot more questions on here than I am answers, which is, I like that, right? Like, um, I myself see, you know, uh, co-dominant trees with poor taper, not much interior foliage, and I think that that's what Brian was hinting at. They're, they're lion's tailed and there are implications to that. So, and then uh, I want everybody to kind of zoom out to a 10,000 foot view and, and really look at the, the broad scope of, of what we've been talking here at the, about the conference, right? Looking at urban forestry um, and what, what's our responsibility as the landscapers, arborists, landscape architects, and how we can all contribute to making a more resilient urban forest. <coughs> awesome. Well, I say climb them in August. That's a good question. Yeah. No. Um, no. Too close together. Awesome. Cool. And you want to 
cue us with the next question. Yeah, I just want to give a little bit of background because Brian talked to me about this earlier. Um, he said last year they only had access to rainfall, and prior to that they were regularly watered uh, two to three times a week for most of their life. Um, so are these trees drought stressed? And does that and should that affect their pruning prescription? Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that, Kayla. So yeah, there's a little bit more context here. These are actually trees, if I'm not mistaken, Brian, that are in your neighborhood, so you're quite familiar with this, Stan. And, and the watering was once every two or three weeks. Once every two or three weeks. Cheers. Yeah, so we have kind of the, um, that bigger, bigger picture from a drought perspective. These are some of the other questions, if I may, Brian, that you posed. How would A300 Part 1 apply to this, right? So these are some things we can avail ourselves to um, uh, as a way to, to kind of put ourselves in, in a good position to make a good determination about what to do. Um, yeah, yeah, please. One of the things that I see with this is I've pruned trees like this before. Yes? Who are you? Hi, my name is Patrick O'Mara. I'm an ISA certified arborist and a climber specialist out of Denver. I didn't know what this end was. Okay, yeah. great. So we, right, now we, you know a third of it. Yeah, we have Miranda, Patrick, Dana, and John. Okay, yeah. thank you. So if I uh, prune that and it looks like that, it's because it was dead inside already. And so I, I get out of trees sometimes, and it looks like I've lion's tailed them, but the entire interior is dead. So I, I'm not going to condemn this and say, oh, that's terrible pruning. If those were, you know, someone said it depends. If those were all dead branches on the inside, then yeah, go ahead and do that to every single tree if it's dead branches. Uh, but if it were live branches that you're taking out, then I would suggest, yeah, we're probably not doing those, uh, those trees a favor by doing so. Awesome. Thanks so much, Patrick. Uh, for getting us going here, right? So, a couple other questions, right? Who, yeah, let's see. Yep. Right. Yeah, thanks so much, Dodie. I, I feel like uh, a lot of what we're hearing here is just impetus for more more questions to be asked as opposed to like a hard conclusion to, to draw. Um, and then you, we have the next question. What are some long-term effects these trees might face? Death, wind damage, sun scald, vulnerability to high winds, splitting under high wind. Yep, systematic failure to, due to poor structure limb die off. Thanks everybody for contributing. So we're going to move now to the questions that you all posed. Um, thanks for doing that. Is there a way that they can continue to contribute to that, Kayla? Or is that like, yeah. I think we probably have enough questions, actually, so sorry yeah, for asking that. OK, so the first question that we have for our panelists is, with no regulation, how do we prevent improper pruning? Um, we have about, looks like, 11 questions and 40 some odd minutes. So I'm going to just move this along. If you all could be kind of brief with your answers. Um, so how, with no regulations or with little regulation in the state of New Mexico, how do we prevent improper pruning? How would you recommend as we as a community, meaning arborist, landscape architects, landscape maintenance folks in New Mexico handle this? I would add on that, how does this fit in kind of the broader picture of what we've been discussing with urban uh, force interfacing and um, the, the different pests that we're seeing, EAB? So. I can, I can jump in if that works. Dana Coelho, Colorado State Forest Service, Urban and Community Forestry Program Lead. Um, what I would say is that in, in the absence of regulation or if there's weak regulation, that education and community building, I think even in the presence of good regulation, um, is always going to be um, beneficial in not only stopping improper pruning, but showing people, showing professionals, showing hobbyists, showing homeowners, whoever, how to do things right with what tools and how to call folks into 
that conversation instead of running around like the pruning police going, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. Invite someone into a conversation. Hey, I saw you make this cut. Why did you do that? Why do you use the tools that you do? Have you ever considered doing it this way and try to have, have a conversation, build some community, create opportunities for learning? Love that, Dana. Thank you. Yeah, so we got the, got the carrot, not the stick, right? Grassroots as opposed to top down. Yeah. Last week in Denver, we put on ni uh, 19 arborist classes for the Pro Green Expo. And we were specifically trying to train the trainers. We were doing these classes for arborists. Because if you try, if you can reach the arborists and train the arborists, those are the people who are going to be out talking to all those customers, telling them lion's tailing is not what we're going for. Topping is not what we're going for. They are hearing it from the professionals. And the more of us professionals who can say the right things, uh, the better off all of our urban canopies will be. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. And it, I, I would just jump in and say, yeah, the education part and the modeling part. And so if you can educate the working arborists and then there are young people in those companies who are learning from those people and they're going to be learning uh, why. And I think why is a really important question. Why are you making that pruning cut in the way you are? Why is that cut needed? And, you know, when it's just a matter of, well, we need to drop a bunch of brush on the ground, well, okay, let's, let's rethink that question and answer. Um, I don't think in this political and in economic environment that we live in that we're ever going to stop bad pruning. There's always going to be people coming in at the bottom of the market, hitting the unknowing homeowner and doing substandard work. So I think we, we lead by example. We try to establish really good practices when we try to educate people. But it's really hard to, even with regulation, it's really hard to take that bottom out. And so you just have to push the top. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Fantastic. So yeah, kind of talking about the market, right, and trying to sell a higher standard of work. Um, Okay, anybody else? Any other remaining thoughts? Okay. Um, next question, can and do insects that commonly affect pino and pine? So this is one that you already addressed, Dr. Formby. Um, in this area, jump to different species. But we have three entomologists on stage, so I figured I'd kind of leave that on there. So, Date, Miranda or Graham, do you, do you have any other kind of thoughts or anything? <laughs> I don't. It seems to me that they, uh, Pignon just has a whole set of pests that come with it. It's weird for a, for a, uh, for a native tree to just have such a, a wide selection of pests. And I don't, I don't know that any of them are transferring to, to other trees, if that's what the question was. Yeah. Okay. If I can, I have opinions on a lot of things that I don't actually have knowledge on. Uh, my opinion is that insects evolve very quickly, and if we get to a situation where they eat all of what they evolved eating, some of them are going to evolve to eat something else. Cool. Okay, cool. We're actually moving right along here, so there might be time for everybody to ask some more questions. What are some indicators of tree health that can be observed visually? Further, stressed indicators, stressed indicators are commonly discussed. Let's briefly discuss stress and health. So maybe visual stress in our urban canopy. Pretty general question, but. Yeah, these, these are all um, questions that were submitted yesterday and today. And I think the question was about indicators of stress. Uh, and I know we talk a lot about um, stress indicators, and so I just wanted to get both sides, indicators of stress and also indicators of health and vitality. So if, if everybody could. Uh, first thing would be uh, that I can think of on, on vitality is just looking at what was last year's, what does last year's growth look like? You can see where the terminal bud scar was um, the previous year and just see how much growth you got. Um, that would that would cue you in right away to the overall state, and then maybe from there looking at uh, at um, 
uh, starting with the leaves. Is there tip burn? Is there uh, any kind of defoliation going on? Anything like that that can clue you in further? I take a look at something uh, like I can picture Dr. Gilman would, which is if you have a vigorous tree and it's really growing and growing and green and super healthy looking, you're now introducing physical stresses on that tree. You now have a much longer lever arm that, uh, that the forces of, of wind and snow and whatnot are going to be acting on. So even though you might have that vitality and vigor, you might be introducing a second stressor, which is not as, as visible. But I mean, we just had a snowstorm in Denver that decimated ash trees. And uh, I mean, and it exposed all of these weakened structural points on them. So, and if you looked at uh, the whole, there were a lot of really long branches that went down in that storm. So just because a tree is vigorous and healthy doesn't necessarily mean that it's not stressed. Two things that I remember learning in conferences in the past that, that have been useful to me to just kind of assess either stress or vitality, and it's two sides of the, of the coin there. Um, from a distance, looking at the tree, how much dead tip do you see in the outer canopy? The more dead tip you see, the more that tree is, is stressing and dying back. And then looking through the canopy, how much blue sky do you see? And the, the less dense that canopy, the more stress it's under relative to the species. And so those are just two quick things that I like to look at is, is dead branch tips in the, in the outer part of the canopy and blue sky through the canopy. Great. Awesome. Thank you, panelists. Uh, next question we have. If you are leaving leaf litter in the landscape to preserve beneficial insect habitat, at what point is it safe to remove the leaf litter? So this was kind of asked yesterday. Um, but yeah, anybody have any thoughts in regard to that question? Don't. Don't leave it. unless uh, you are trying to create defensible space around your home, right? There's always going to be trade-offs in any management decision, any landscape that, that you're managing. There are lots of really, really amazing reasons to leave leaf litter on the ground for nutrients, for those beneficial insects. But if you're in a fire-prone landscape, if that's something that you're concerned about, leaving that um, fuel, that small dry fuel on the ground, especially very close to or touching structures, no, no, no. Create at least that five foot space around each, um, each structure. Have it somewhere else. Maybe have it moist. Right. Somebody asked, is it based on temperature? Is it based on a calendar date? Um, yeah. Temperature, <clears throat> for sure. Um, <clears throat> so they're overwintering. That's what they're doing. So come springtime, they're emerging. They're, they're going about their business. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> if the person wants to remove the material, then, uh, you know, I'd say spring. Spring would be fine. And I'll throw in another uh, anti-leaf argument um there, there might be specific pests that that you uh might want to remove leaves for like grape leaf hopper uh if you're if you're worried about your grapes next year or i think sycamore scale there's probably a bunch more um what'd you say powdery mildew, powdery mildew. yeah another there might be specific reasons why you would move, remove them earlier also and don't forget about your bee hotels and those types of things Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're kind of switching over to wildland fire here. So regarding the 2022 fires, how did they start and how were they put out? What learning experiences can we gain from those tragedies? I'll throw in part B here, too. Could you speak more to the benefits of fire that, you know, kind of weigh, counterbalance that? I found there's a lot of fear surrounding wildland fire, rightfully so. How can we as arborists educate ourselves and clients on the benefits as well? This uh, question was originally posed for Randy Lyle, uh, specifically about the 2022 fires. So I'm not sure if folks want to. Yeah, yeah. And then I also asked Tom Swetnam for um, 
an answer on this as well. So I'll say that at the end. Yeah, I think that getting their expert opinions and knowledge on the how did these start, how were they responded to, I'm not someone that can speak to that, but in terms of acknowledging that fire in fire adapted ecosystems is beneficial, that is true, right? And if we are working in fire adapted landscapes, we have to be at least a little conversant in fire ecology. We have to understand a little bit about it and what fire behavior looks like today, what it looked like 20 years ago, maybe what it looked like 100 years ago, and how we might be designing and managing our landscapes differently so that more predictable, smaller, less intense, more regularly recurring fires can return to these landscapes instead of conflagrations, whether those are in a grassland and an urban ecosystem, or they're in, say in Colorado, we have lots of mountain ecosystems, very, very dense tree populations there. Too dense because no active management has been happening there, because 100 plus years of fire suppression has been happening there. They are ready to burn and ready to burn incredibly intensely, such that some of them will never grow back as forests. That's not what we want. We want more frequent, less intense fire. And if we consider ourselves as arborists, landscapers, urban foresters, part of the land management community, we can absolutely engage in those conversations, become educated ourselves, and you know, communicate that urban places are a part of that fire ecology and wildfire management conversation. Thank you. Thoughts? Um, okay. So um. I want to say, Tom, um, I, got, I got a chance to speak with Tom, and he's incredible. I think everybody will agree his presentation was awesome. Yeah, yeah Tom. Yeah. Woo. And what he said to me was pretty interesting. Um, he said that he, he talked so fast, so I had to type this out really fast. So. Part of it's not coherent, but I'm going to try. He said that it's essential that homeowners take responsibility and firewise their homes. I know personally, I have worked with HOAs before in the past, and they've adopted these firewise guidelines, which essentially, I don't know if you remember from Dana's talk, it says, you know, 50 feet away from the house, 150 feet, 200 feet, whatever. It gets sparser. Well, it gets, it's more sparse closer to the home. And I know that I've had concerns about people removing trees because they are so scared of fire. And so we're losing healthy trees um, and making a moonscape. Somebody used that term recently. And he told me that we need to recognize uh, that it's time to change our baseline, which is what we're most familiar with. And yes, we love our ornamental grasses, we love our shrubs, our native plants, we love that general aesthetic, uh, that native aesthetic, but if you are truly concerned about protecting your home from fire, then it's essential that you take the responsibility of f using that method. He says, getting fuels immediately away within 50 to 100 feet, most, not all, he says, uh, specifically leaves, things in gutters, uh, if you have a wooden deck. Um, and he says the, the primary concern would be embers. So fire is starting from embers. Uh, and then he also told me um, that if it's a really intense fire, then there's truly nothing that you uh, can do. Um, he, says, he says mulch is not too big of a concern. Marisa was at that conversation and she um, promotes using mulch around the landscape. And I think that's very beneficial because it has a lot like weed suppression, cooling the root zone. Uh, I think it's more aesthetically pleasing personally and it cools us as well. So he said that's not too big of a concern. Um, he says spruce fir forests um, and burning isn't necessarily happening uh, at higher elevations. Like he's not, he's not too concerned. Um, he says if climate doesn't change much more, then those forests will come back. 
So he's not concerned about the higher elevations, but he is concerned with juniper and pinon forest uh, ember fires. And I just put asterisks, super important, ember awareness. Yeah. Jordan, do you want to talk a little bit to the, the pinon forest and how kind of uh, a lot of people in the East Mountains are really used to that and they think that's really healthy, but it's kind of abnormal in a, f a fire landscape and how they use the same you know, water and how that relates to maybe like bark beetle? Yeah, well, it's, and I think it, not that I'm an expert in this at all, but it, and it was referred to kind of by some of the other talks, but if you've got 10 trees on an acre or 100 trees on an acre, you might have the same amount of biomass. But in the 100 tree case, you're gonna have a lot of small stress trees very close together. And yeah, they're potentially using the same volume of water as the 10 trees that have that same amount of biomass, but they're a lot more vulnerable. Um, and people, you know, moving into the areas like the East Mountains, they, they move out there because it's a forest and we, we like living in a forest. And I've, in my childhood growing up, I moved all over the place and it was almost always out in the woods somewhere. So I understand that. Um, but because we haven't understood that these are or were historically fire adapted landscapes with those low frequency thinning fires, we stopped that and, and now we can't stop that fire when it does start. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would rather, you know, have 10 trees that were in good condition than 100 trees that were struggling. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm getting to what you were no, after. That's great, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. I also want to add on another question that is you know, pretty directly related. I think it's one of the last questions we got. So uh, native grasses, I know this from experience because I've worked with HOAs who do this. Um, native grasses are being trimmed and required to be trimmed one to two inches from the base. Uh, trees, including conifers, are being limbed up uh, two to five feet from the base. Are there better ways to reduce fire hazards without destroying the landscape or do we just deal with the new aesthetics? So we just deal. Um, yeah, new aesthetics. Um, I think it's time for a lot of shifting of aesthetics. We're in a changing environment. Um, we're putting more people on the land. The land is hotter and drier. Um, now, does that mean we need to limb everything up real high? I, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm more inclined to say let's grow fewer trees better than a lot of trees poorly. I'm, I'm down with that. And growing those few trees well, caring for them, and growing them in the right place. So again, looking back at some of those firewise design principles, that home ignition zone, having the right plants and right building materials, frankly, in, in the right places and thinking about their, their flammability, I think is really, really, really valuable. So if that, that spruce tree, right, I'm thinking about limbing up a spruce tree and I've been on enough jobs with Patrick here that no, I wouldn't want to see that limbed up, you know, too far. Um, I'd want to see it farther away from the home, right, with a nice, healthy, um, regularly applied mulch layer under it, maybe with some kind of regular irrigation. So it is a healthy, vibrant, resilient tree. And the first thing that came to my mind, I mean, less about um, fire management, but maybe about fire management, and I'm not a grassland ecologist or anything, but this notion that native grasses would get mowed and maintained like a yard, you know, a blue fescue kind of thing, totally not how they grow and how they can and, and should be managed. Um, I would talk to a grassland ecologist about like better, you know, what that, what that looks like, but taking these ornamental approaches to a more native landscape, not sure that's gonna get us where we wanna be. Cool, and we're kind of talking about shifting perspectives on landscape and aesthetic while we're at it, uh, do you, any of you have any like thing to say about like the xeric landscape you see in the southwest, or how you see that manifesting as stress in trees and urban? Well, speaking forest? of xeric, let's take Hunter's question. Put together a yard 
Thanks for that. Amen. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Does tree diversity actually make it more difficult for EAB to find its host? Yes, in the sense that on average there would be fewer ash. If you um, have a more diverse urban forest, then fewer of those trees are going to be that host species. So. Yes, it's still going to look for ash, but they're going to be less less plentiful. So, yes. I take care of an HOA near my house that is 650 trees, 500 of which are green ash. So they are going to get hit, and we're only taking care of 156 of them right now uh, in terms of chemical treatments. It's the most important ash to the neighborhood, uh, the ones to the school, to the pool, major entrances, things like that. And what I've been advocating is I've been introducing five different types of trees, including uh, western hackberry, uh, western catalpa, a number of trees like that. And they don't want to take out any of their ash. So they're going to wait till the beetle comes in their, in their minds, and that's going to take out some ash. And, and I think that's a terrible approach, too. So what I'm trying to advocate right now is to at least get some other trees planted. If you've got rows of ash, start getting some other trees planted in there, especially because there's already this ash forest. If I'm planting some hackberry, they're going to grow more like forest trees. They're going to be more growing up like this, searching the light, instead of getting these long lever arms that are going to be snapped in storms. So that's what I'm pushing right now, is that diversity, even within a very non-diverse uh, forest. That's brilliant. So yeah, so that kind of goes back to the pruning question, right? Like there's ways that we can prune trees and stress them out, and you're um, eliminating that from the get-go. Yep. I'm reminded of hearing Dr. John Ball speak about um, pest, <coughs> excuse me, pest and, and host uh, correlations. And, and what was interesting in his comments was that uh, he felt the genus level was the focus level we needed to look at, where something like, again, EAB, it's attacking Fraxinus as a genus. Um, and so looking at those genera that have few or just one species, they tend to have uh, fewer pests. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, ultimately it's the EA, the, the, the emerald ash borer is probably going to still find the ash that are out there. There just aren't as many to find. They're still going to find them, but it's not going to impact your forest as much. And uh, throw one more question in there. What are some underplanted trees in New Mexico, appropriate for New Mexico? Someone told me at lunch, uh, Japanese pagoda tree. They, they do fairly well for us where I've seen them. And I, I don't know how drought tolerant they are, but in well-irrigated settings, they seem to do real good. Um, we are definitely in danger of overplanting like Chinese pistache, which is a, is a rock-solid tree for us. And we're overplanting it because of that, right? And so far, knock on wood, I don't think there's any uh, pest or disease issue with it, but that may be coming. Yeah, I, I like all the all the trees that don't have inherent pests with them. So working for extension, you would get phone calls and people would start by saying what type of tree they had and you already knew what they were going to ask you already just based off of that species. So uh, hackberry comes to mind. There's no no real pest for that one. There's uh, you know, there's a there's uh, maybe an uh, annoying um, galling pest for it, but nothing that's going to cause damage to the health of the tree and you I think that's common hackberry for a large tree you could have net leaf hackberry for a smaller tree that's basically not planted at all um, anything without without pests uh, sounds great to me <laughs> so pinon is off the list pinon's off my list even though it's native yeah the only thing I would add to that, there's been some really great research that the Nature Conservancy has done um, in New Mexico on climate-ready trees. I'm not going to try to quote uh, anything in particular from that, but if you were to look up TNC or the Nature Conservancy climate-ready trees, New Mexico, um, I think you'll find some good research there. And then the states of New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, those state forestry 
agencies have been collaborating on some, some similar work looking across those states and those climates and what trees are performing really well and what trees might be uh, uh, performing well as the climate continues to be wacky. And Graham and I are setting up a GoFundMe that you can contribute to, and we will travel the world and find good trees. So. Uh, and then you can come tell us about it at the Tree Diversity Conference exactly. in Colorado in early March. I just want to add, uh, somebody has submitted a question that kind of relates to this. And they say, how do we widen the number of tree varieties when many are not available here yet at nurseries and many landscape designers and landscape architects tend to spec the same species over and over. Do we need to gather these people together on a regular basis? That's a real chicken and egg question, right? If you're a commercial nurseryman, it's a hard economic road to say, I'm gonna start growing stuff that people aren't yet demanding very much of because I know eventually they're gonna want this. Um, that's putting a lot of risk out there. But until they're out there, people aren't gonna be saying, oh yeah, we can use that. And I know a number of projects where the designer spec'd some pretty good stuff, but by the time it came to put the job together, they went to the nursery and they said, oh, we got a row of ash left. You want those? Yeah. Okay. So sometimes the specking is good, but the supply isn't. I, I would just add to that, I mentioned that Front Range Recommended Trees List is, was put together um, a decade ago and we're in the process of renewing it. Right now, um, updating it right now, and that is absolutely a conversation among arborists, extension, urban foresters, growers, um, individuals in the nursery industry, so are even more explicitly considering the availability of those recommended trees, because we've had the same problem, like, oh, you should grow, you know, you should be planting more of this, and you can't find it. But if we can bring together, you know, large buyers of trees, say multiple municipalities. We're having that conversation in the front range of Colorado right now. Can they come together, have a conversation with some, some growers, some nurseries, and contract in advance? We want you know, 500 of this and 1,000 of this and 100 of this so that those nurseries can get the liners, grow those trees over the, the two years that it'll take to get them to an appropriate plantable size in a municipal setting and then those are available. And the risk is now spread out over a number of municipalities who have said, I will purchase and plant these trees if you grow them. So it's only when you get those folks in the same room together you, that you can get over that chicken and egg problem. Be like, well, I'm not gonna grow it because nobody's buying it. Well, I can't buy it because it's not available. So why don't you talk to each other and figure out what you need and what you're willing to grow, what kind of risk folks are willing to take on. So we're experimenting with that and it's kind of exciting. I think that's a great model too because you can invoke the public sector to take risks that the private sector may not. And so if these municipalities come together and say, you know, we're not sure if this is gonna work, let's get 500 and plant them and see. And if it does, then you've created a market. And if it doesn't, it was a shared risk and the cost is disseminated across all the taxpayers and it doesn't hit somebody's business bottom line. And, and I'll throw out a third option other than public or private sector, the individual. Um, if you've got one tree that, that's not available and, and uh, uh, you really wanna see it out there, it's not that hard to grow trees. Um, you can collect seed and and maybe you can work on that on that one tree. I really like net leaf hackberries. I grew them last year. Um, you can grow a lot of them in a small space. It's not a it's not a, a great commercial venture, but it could be a fun side project. If I can jump in real quick, this is my wheelhouse, and um, I could speak for days on this, but this is a real huge reason why we gather is to talk because we're growers. And um, I appreciate what you said, Jordan, about the cart before the horse. I mean, we grew about 200 McClure white clouds back in the late 90s. Nobody had a clue what that was. I wish I had 200 McClures right now because I could sell every one of them. The great thing about what happens when we gather is the conversation about diversity really gets... Uh, 
center stage on everything we've talked about, diversity has really ruled the roost. A at Trees of Krause, we're trying to do that. And I remember when we started growing elms, and there's a sneeze ordinance here in Albuquerque, and everybody goes, what are you growing elms for? You can't sell them. Well, there's, we sell to other states. But elm, as you guys know, is a four-letter word. But, you know, most happy homeowners and most H HOAs and all that you guys deal with, they don't want to plant an elm, and they run the other direction. That's changing. But the great thing about talking like this, we can then come in and tell you guys, which you know, there's, there's hybrid elms. They don't produce seed. There's, there's a lot of new things that are coming out, but it takes, like we've talked before, to introduce some of these new trees into the trade. It was 25 years to get the first American elm out into the market to folks like us to grow them on then for another five years to then sell them to you guys. There's a long, long uh, growth in all of this. Celtus reticulata, I can talk an, an entire day about that. That's one of my favorite trees. And we're collecting seed and getting it going. But anyway, I, I took enough time. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. That was awesome. So Andrew of Trees of Corrales. Okay, so uh, one last set of questions, and then we'll see if we can't open it up a little bit to other questions. I saw Marisa and another gentleman raise his hand. <clears throat> Trees benefit all. However, the city of Albuquerque discourages water use. This has led to hundreds of dead trees all over the city. Any comments? Another question. Some say we are living on borrowed water time, borrowed time here in the southwest with regard to water and our water table. So, any thoughts? Also, uh, somebody mentioned all this sad news and bummers. Where are the smiles and positivity? If you guys could maybe say something good, like sandwich. Make maybe? us feel good. Sandwich <laughs> method. Let's use the sandwich method for this. Uh, and then we'll also, Hunter, do you just want to give us a question right now? Thank you. Did everybody hear that? No? Okay. So the Water Authority does offer rebates on planting trees. Uh, they offer rebates on uh, irrigation installation um, and, he, and maintenance yeah. of those trees. And he also said, Hunter also mentioned that the Water Authority recognized some of the damage that was done with maybe deterring some watering. Uh, and they have made improvements to the rebate to address that problem. Sunshine and smiles, all the crappy trees are dying. <laughs> you know, really, I look at all the, uh, I live in South Denver and we, everybody plants autumn blaze maples. And because of the soil uh, pH, they can't uptake the nutrients. So they're all yellow. They're all the color of yellow shirts. Right. And people call them golden maples. And so as they're dying off, we're replacing them with better trees. So I do think it's positive that these crappy trees or trees that aren't good for our area are dying. They should be dying. It's not like we're going to start getting all this water and temperatures are going to cool off. That's not going to happen. So if that's the case, get rid of these. Get rid of the bad trees and start planting the good ones. I'm happy they're dying. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> Good reframe it. We'll go ahead and put the mics at the front of the room too. So sorry about that, Hunter. But yeah, if you want to come up, if you have any questions or comments, closing thoughts, make sure you say your name, where you're from too. Um, also, there was something that was a little controversial uh, that I really just want to, I really want to get you guys' opinions. Um, somebody said, I don't see that, it's hard, I, I don't know really. I don't see where we are examining pruning, land management, and tree care beyond a forestry-based approach. 
What about agroforestry, traditional land management, management, uh, pollarding, uh, fill in the blank. We have evolved with trees. What's beyond Shigo, ISA, and USDA? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah, so Graham and I were talking about this last night. I highly recommend everybody read this book called Sproutlands. And it's about the human history of coppicing and pollarding trees and how long we've been doing that and how we've, we've lost that knowledge. And there's a few places where people are regaining it. It is a perfectly valid way to maintain trees. And as an example, um, anybody who's from Albuquerque and who's traveled down on South Isleta Boulevard has passed quality baits. You all know Quality Baits, right? That bait shop down South Valley? Yeah. So they have a mulberry out front that they, they pollard every year. And I didn't realize that until I drove by it one spring day and saw all these branches down on the ground and these big, ugly knuckles up there that they had just cut them off from. Well, they're only ugly if you don't know what you're looking at. Those are really very healthy trees, and it helps them maintain a manageable size in a site that otherwise that tree could easily get out of control. I think um, in this book uh, that I mentioned, he, he brings up Shigo, and with all due respect to Shigo, he does say Shigo had his context, which was he worked for the lumber industry, and the goal was clear, straight wood. And that's a perfectly good goal, and it's a strong tree, but that's not the only way that we can manage and, and work with trees. Um, so I think. Part of that, though, is we no longer use wood the way we used to. We don't need all that small wood for charcoal and for building houses and fishing nets and whatever else they used to do with it. But it still is a way we can manage trees and keep them perhaps more compact and, and uh, in some ways safer. Um, and it's, it's that understanding that, that pruning is done for a goal. So what's your goal? Um, and, and it may be a perfectly appropriate way to do it. He captured all my thoughts on that. But uh, on the agroforestry part of it, I guess that uh, we're already doing that uh, in the form of an elm windbreak, but we're not doing much more, uh, much more than that. Um, I think there's tons of opportunity there. We have the whole green belt where we're, where we're already irrigating. And uh, I think there's tons of opportunity to integrate trees into those systems that already exist. Hopefully one, with, with uh, pest-free type of trees. One last thing about that. Uh, so I was just in Copenhagen last uh, September. And these park trees that we were climbing in were massive. They were beech trees, and just some of the most beautiful trees that I've seen. And then you go into the city proper, not in the parks, but in between these buildings, and all of these, these trees were proper size. They were smaller, smaller trees because they've been you know, having things like pollarding. And uh, the Europeans really have it good. They have these really tight cities, but they still want their trees. And so they figured out a way to do that. And I would say uh, growth regulating hormones would be another way uh, that is at least a possibility of something that we could be doing to have bigger trees in smaller spaces effectively. Uh, John, Miranda, and Graham, do you have any thoughts about drought and the insect populations that you've been observing? And kind of water shortage that's probably any kind of takeaways? Uh, my takeaway, uh, treating the insects is, to me, almost always seems like treating the symptom. And the underlying cause is uh, not always, but often drought related. Um, and so they're, they're one and the same. And I, I uh, captured that from John Formby's um, presentation. Um, it seems like, seems like that's the case with a lot of bark beetles. Um, and uh, I really, I'm excited to have all the, the terrible trees die along, <laughs> along with you. <laughs> That's exciting to me. We can move on to, to McClure and, and something, something better. Um, well, I'm obviously sort of water centric in, in Who are you? what I do, but um, um, you know, I think there's so much potential for, 
for rainwater harvesting um, on any level, whether huge or small. Um, for every thousand square foot of hard surface, one inch of range produces 600 gallons of water. So think about that, um, where you have your drains on your house, where w gutters are, where water comes off. Build swales and build ponding areas um, to, uh, to collect that water. That's where you plant your trees. You can put soil sponges, things in there. Um, it can be off hard surfaces. It doesn't have to be the roof. It can be off your your uh, patios, your driveway. Um, there's just a, it, you don't have to have cisterns or rain barrels, but keep the water on your on your property. There's a lot usually off of many hard surfaces available. To, when you're thinking about your process, there even if it's a, an existing landscape, there's usually ways you can use that water. Okay, so we are at time, right on time, and... Uh